Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to welcome you all here uh, in, the, in this wonderful room. I'm glad to welcome you in the name of the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and the Federal Agency for Civic Education, the Bundeszentrale für Politische Bildung. Despite the weather like summer outside, thank you. Thank you for coming. This is the fourth lecture in our series, Making Sense of the Digital Society. With this series, we want to reflect upon ongoing transformations due to the accelerating processes linked to digitalization. While general processes of digitalization started some decades ago, depending on whether you see information technology in general or the internet in particular, a starting point, we can see a noticeable speeding up of establishing new technologies and trends. While it took the telephone or the computer, for example, many years or even decades to hit the one million users mark, some apps or new devices today reach this number of users of participants within hours. And all these devices or more and more of these devices, are today linked to the ability to collect and analyze personal data about our behavior. And it's not always clear or transparent who has access to this data, as lately Cambridge Analytica and Facebook famously presented. In this context, the Federal Agency for Civic Education aims at helping people understand ongoing processes and locate them in the broader picture. And together with the Humboldt Institute, we want to explore the ongoing transformation and focus on the European perspective. Only by understanding which implications come from using new technology apps, devices, platforms, and feeding them with information about ourselves that was long and for long strictly held private or simply not tracked, we can start to understand what possible benefits but also which dangers are connected to them. And afterwards, or with this knowledge, make decisions as informed as empowered citizens. That is why I'm happy that Marion Foucault will speak tonight about social order. In her work, she shows how various ordering mechanisms shape everyday life and how everybody is subject to many ratings and scorings based on numerous tracking, tracking tools and mechanisms. And while these ratings are often justified with positive or even caring arguments, the question remains, do they in the end not simply divide people into two categories? those that are in and those that are out? A question famously articulated by Karl Marx, whose 200 years anniversary was just celebrated this weekend, and Ms. Foucault took, uh, took part in a conference that discussed these changes and this anniversary. And I hope that maybe we can today identify possible steps to take in order to make sure that more people are counted to be in rather than to be counted out. With these questions, I will now hand over to our moderator of the evening, Tobi Müller, who will introduce Marion Foucault pro properly. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you for this wonderful turnout on an evening like this. Now is the time for the last touches to your hair to clean your glasses because this is kind of a surveillance context here. We are being filmed, but we're not being streamed due to uh, technological problems. That sometimes happens even uh, with a series like that, that those things do not work. I apologize for that to the people who can't see me now because we're not being streamed. But there is the chance um, that it will be shown, the whole talk and part of the Q&A on the respective websites 
of um, the Federal Agency for Civic Education and the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and I think YouTube as well. That's where our previous talks uh, can still be viewed, uh, actually. And I guess in this case, the whole hashtag uh, digital society has become uh, obsolete too tonight. So uh, sorry again um, for this. After the talk of our distinguished guest tonight, there's going to be about a 30-minute conversation, I think, between us two. And then it's your turn, uh, not via Twitter, but uh, with live questions in the audience. There's, um, I think, about a couple of microphones that will be passed around, uh, and you'll have the chance to leave your comments and pose your questions for another 30 minutes, half hour, I guess. So, our guest is a comparative sociologist. She studied and lectured at the Sorbonne in uh, Paris. She then moved to Princeton with a stop at New York University, and she got back to Princeton again, and in 2003, she went to University of California, Berkeley, where she is now a full professor of sociology. She is also an associate fellow of the Max Planck Sciences Post Center on Coping with Instability in Market Societies. This is a Franco-German center in the social sciences. Her first book at Princeton University Press won numerous prizes. It is called Economists and Societies, Discipline and Profession in the United States, Britain, and France from the 1890s to the 1990s. So you see she uh, has a keen eye on cultural or national differences, and that really showed when we had a little preparation talk uh, on Skype, and she kept asking me, what do you think? Do we have to translate this? What's the situation in Germany? What's it in Switzerland? I come from Switzerland originally, so we talked a little bit about that when it came to uh, uh, social scoring, credit scoring, tracking, uh, all that, of course. So she really has a keen eye on those differences, and it really shows in her work. Her upcoming book she co-wrote with uh, Kieran Healy, with whom she authored many uh, articles. It's called The Ordinal Society. This is, I guess, in a nutshell, what she will talk about today, social stratification and morality in digital economies. Please welcome Marion Fourcade. So thank you very much for this invitation. It's a real pleasure. I love Berlin. Uh, <laughs> and uh, oh. there it is. So it's a real pleasure to be here and also to be part of this uh, very uh, uh, interesting and distinguished series. Um, so we typically relate to digital services the way we relate to public goods, like education or national defense. We take them for granted and we don't think often about how or how much we pay for them. So you can think of a lot of things, you know, search services or location services, uh, you know, that come just with an internet or cellular connection. Um, and then we can think of a whole range of services um, that, you know, used to be um, housed in our computers or in separate programs and uh, increasingly come uh, under the label of cloud computing. You know, they are stored uh, in, uh, in the cloud. So you can think of social networking, communication, storage, all kinds of collaboration tools, the synchronization of your computer, uh, and even increasingly uh, uh, office tools. Um, so, you know, the question for us is, you know, um, we used to pay for these services. We, you know, they were, um, we used to pay for the, surf, uh, for the software. We used to pay or occasionally for the services and not anymore. Today, these are off-the-shelf programs um, that come under, under this cloud computing label. Uh, so we use Google Docs to store uh, documents without giving a second thought. A thought. And, and in fact, many schools uh, encourage their students, uh, the, the, the kids, to, to, to store all of their work uh, online. And of course, you know, Facebook, Dropbox, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on also work this way. Um, so, you know, um, this is the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> so the question for us is, you know, what does it mean uh, to, uh, to have uh, everything going through uh, this uh, technological uh, uh, infrastructure? 
Um, now, of course, you know, companies had early on an incentive to, to offer free services. Uh, you can think of Google Earth or Google Maps. You know, they were expensive for Google to develop, but they allowed it to draw people to spend as much time uh, within its online ecosystem as possible. Facebook's business success, by contrast, depends on an internet structure that was more gated and seg segregated into proprietary realms. But, so there are differences in the way in which different kinds of companies uh, work, uh, you know, find their way around this, uh, in, into this uh, um, economy. But by and large, uh, what we have is, you know, we have a sort of Faustian bargain, right? Of course, states never provided education or national defense for free. We pay taxes, right? And likewise, cloud computing or search or uh, all kinds of internet services are not free. So this talk is really about the implications of that situation for the way we should think today about processes of stratification and inequality. Uh, I know, you know, when, when we talk about... Um, you know, the new data economy, we worry a lot about privacy. Uh, we worry about questions of, uh, you know, freedom. Um, but, you know, we don't often ask, well, what kind of society are we building? You know, what kind of social order? Uh, how is inequality going to look like in that society? So, you know, this is what I'm going to try to present today. And of course, a lot of this is speculative because the society hasn't yet fully come into being. So let me begin with a quote. After a question um, that um, uh, me, uh, my research assistant and myself asked about mentioning people who express dismay about companies like Facebook collecting personal data and building out personal profile, Jake Ford, CEO and founder of EagleNet, exclaimed, Hey, Dillbag, you're getting it for free. They have to make money somehow. Um, and of course, you know, I, I should mention this, all of these are pseudonyms. You know, all the quotes that I'm going to give tonight are pseudonyms. Um, uh, they're real people, but uh, they're not uh, correct names and they're not correct company names either. So you have to admire the creativity uh, that we put <laughs> <laughs> into producing this. But then he proceeded to explain uh, his business model. He said, the big picture is that our goal at EagleNet is to have tens of millions of business professionals using the EagleNet platform for free, or some form of free, providing the data. And then we go and sell that data and those insights to enterprise customers. That's our business model. Uh, here's another one. Um, uh, this is uh, Max Buck, co-founder uh, and CEO of another company, uh, Elliptical. And uh, he says, Elliptical is basically a free card source, uh, I can't tell you what it does, database. So the way that it works is that it's a completely free product, again, this language of freedom. And users sign up in order to get this free thing from our database. Essentially, it's a gift to get model. In order to get this from our database, you need to anonymously share your other thing with us. Okay, and you have lots of examples like this, obviously, um, and you know the examples are both for the relationship between companies and users, but also between uh, 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 in the relationship um, between companies themselves, right? Uh, so, for instance, and again, a good example that uh, uh, another interviewee uh, mentioned to us would be a company uh, offering free or discounted services in order to run uh, A-B testing on a client's ad or in exchange for information about the company's final decision. So, for instance, a company um, wants, say, Google or, uh, you know, some other uh, advertising behemoths to uh, run advertising, uh, advertisement to um, a large audience to, uh, for, uh, for jobs, and then um, uh, in exchange of the company providing information on who was hired in the end, right, uh, you will discount the price. So again, this sort of uh, gift to get uh, exchange. So the client, say, may pay for 20,000 people, but the ad is run on 100,000 people, and then, you know, Google or whichever other company is, uh, you know, manages to, to get this additional information that, does, that allows it to refine its algorithm for the next time this kind of request comes around. Okay, so there's a lot, you know, uh, the modern digital economy is built upon an implicit Faustian bargain. 
on the one hand, companies provide services for free, right? Tempting us, like Faust, with universal knowledge at the tip of our keyboard. But in order to access this information, we have to give away our soul, you know, to continue the, the Faustian metaphor, leaving behind little bits of data that are so many indications of who we really are or what we really do. Um, how interesting is it uh, that in Latin, data may be translated as things given or gifts? Uh, in fact, the first English uh, language definition in 1587 uh, defines datum as a thing given, a gift delivered or sent. So, uh, how does that happen? Of course, on the technical side, uh, there's a whole internet infrastructure that enables the circulation of certain kinds of data. And you can think about it as, um, you know, phones and call logs and geolocation services, JavaScript uh, tracking mechanisms in browsers and devices, cookies deposited on people's computers that facilitate the identification of users over long periods of time, and they help website build longitudinal files. Um, and then, of course, identification is increasingly precise and individualized, you know. Um, more and more site, sites require a login. IP addresses um, uh, anchor also uh, the individualization. Um, and then increasingly, other techniques like digital fingerprinting, which is a way of sort of tracking, you know, uh, uh, without depositing anything into the computer. Uh, but it tracks, you know, it looks at the specific patterns of typing, uh, of, sorry, the specific configuration of the computer or, in, or increasingly the pattern of typing or using the mouse. Um, so there is this whole infrastructure that, you know, uh, that allows for things to be taken, if you will. But then, of course, uh, the technical infrastructure would not deliver data if there were not people to populate it. So the power of digital companies also relies on a choice infrastructure that helps draw people in. Now, I will discuss two fundamental aspects of it, of this choice ar architecture. The first aspect is what we could call the two-sided market problem, um, which, is, which refers actually to a, 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 an economic uh, theory uh, which sort of uh, looks at the way in which the particular uh, 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 infrastructure might, uh, might allow uh, the creation of a network effect. So how, you know, how, to, uh, you know, uh, how to make sure that your platform, your standard, becomes the standard platform? So you have, in, in two-sided markets, you have to cater to two types of audiences. On the one hand, you have your users, and on the other hand, you have, say, your developers. Or, you know, so for instance, uh, the, you know, the example that uh, economists Tirol and Rocher uh, give is, you know, Visa. So Visa has users, uh, so they want users to adopt a Visa card, but it also has business owners, you know, store owners, and they have to also have vis you know, Visa uh, to, um, uh, for, for, the, for the, the standard to sort of take on, okay? So the way, and, and a lot of platforms work that way. The way that you uh, will draw in users is typically by offering free services, but the way you draw in developers is by offering users, in a sense. And so you add to the attractiveness of your own platform by attracting developers who will produce lots of additional functionalities. Um, and, you know, of course, the app model was pioneered by Apple, um, and it was associated with, uh, with, uh, with hardware, you know, with the iPhone. Uh, but, you know, you can think of, you know, now all of these um, uh, APIs that, that allow, you know, for this connection to, to take place. Um, so the more third-party apps, the more uh, application programming interfaces, the more users, and the more users, the more developers. So that's the sort of, you know, that's how you create this network effect. Um, and of course, you know, if you think of, say, uh, Facebook, you know, uh, uh, which is now cracking down on these third-party apps because of the privacy problems. But, you know, in the early days, this is how Facebook and a lot of other companies managed to sort of expand rapidly was by offering um, lots of developers opportunities to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to create apps that would add, as one of our uh, uh, interviewees said, functionality 
to the Facebook platform. Okay, so you know developers have to gain something from this, you know, and the something is usually data. So, so that's the first problem, you know. Um, so, you know, if you look at uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 the development platform uh, rules, you know, uh, this is typically what uh, you know you would look at. Uh, you know, you would you would. Uh, so, for instance, for users, it's, it's the, in the third paragraph here, you know, for users, it says, now, you know, um, we enforce the same set of privacy rules for your information as when you're on Facebook, but now you can choose to use your information in the applications developed by other people through your platform. And that's typically the way that, um, that uh, this sort of net network effect was uh, produced. Um, the other, of course, element in this choice architecture is, you know, getting people to consent, right? So on the one hand, you have to attract users and dev you, you have to attract developers, and on the other hand, you have to attract users, and you attract users, um, you, you have to, to make sure that the users will actually release the data, otherwise the developer's side will not uh, be, um, uh, you know, will not be flocking to your, to your platform. And so how do you do this? Well, essentially, and here again, there are economic theories to explain this. You know, this is the theory of Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein uh, in, in their book Nudge. You know, you will find, you will uh, have a choice architecture that will sort of bury the information about consent. So typically the way that, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, websites uh, have done this is through uh, default setting. And the importance of default settings is very well documented in the economics li literature. It's documented as a tool for policy. So for instance, if you want people to give organs, you know, what do you do? You have a default setting in which they give their organs unless they opt out. Okay, if you want people to, um, to take health insurance, you will have a default setting in which they are enrolled automatically unless they opt out. Okay, well, this is exactly the same thing. You know, uh, you have a default setting in which you are enrolled unless you uh, exit. Okay, so, um, so it's, uh, you know, these default settings were a critical element in uh, the architecture, if you will, the, 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 the choice architecture that allowed for this process to take place. Um, so the outcome, of course, of this is that individuals now release personal data into this sort of largely invisible material uh, infrastructure. And then the usable data automatically feeds back to the original site owner and also via services through uh, third parties. Um, so the things are taken, right? Autom you know, uh, that was the technical ar architecture. There's a choice architecture that allows for this sort of gift to get model to take place. Uh, another aspect that is really important is the way that things are being sorted, right? Um, the, question, you know, the question often with information is, you know, it's not so much whether you have information or not, but how useful that information is. And of course, we have, you can see, I mean, for those of you, many of you are uh, quite young here, but for those of you who remember the early days of Facebook, you just liked, and that was it. Well, uh, but now, you know, you have all of this range of emotions that you can express, right? So the information is um, increasingly uh, refined. Uh, so in fact, these servers increasingly nudge us to tag, to label, to share, to sort. In other words, to spontaneously refine the data ourselves. And of course, that this is on our end, but this, there's also a lot of it that is happening on the other end, on the side of developers, where, you know, the, uh, again, the, the interface between the site and the, and, the, and the apps, the servers and the apps are also, have also been refined. Um, so that's one example, you know, the expansion of the possible, the range of possible uh, emotions of Facebook. Uh, so the way that we produce more and more refined content is precisely by sort of, uh, you know, making your users more engaged. And this is, of course, this is the way that the, that the industry uh, talks about it. More engagement is essentially uh, uh, more, 
refining work. Here's another example of this, uh, you know, from a, a ride share, a, a riding service, a taxi riding service. It used to be that you would just ride, uh, rate your driver, you know, on a four or f uh, on a five star scale, but increasingly, the drive, you know, they have all of these aspects that, that are being uh, rated, right? Um, so, uh, these are in part, of course, uh, designed to, again, obtain data that is more refined, but also they are designed to help encourage competitions among drivers, right? So you both help Uber refine its knowledge of the drivers, but you also uh, create something in which, you know, a place where you can at least excel in one of those things, you know. Um, you can get like a badge, you know, for <coughs> one of those things. Um, now, now, all of this work, in turn, serves to power the development of advertising services, predictive analytics, and increasingly in artificial intelligence systems. So, you know, in addition to things taken, things given, things sorted, we have things automated, right? So, tag your own photos, and Apple makes giant steps in uh, facial or image recognition. Click on the tenth rather than the first link on your Google search return, and next time it will be optimized to better fit your preferences. Correct the translation, as I'm showing here, you know, this is the translation of my talk, and you are doing your part in helping Google develop automated translation through machine learning. And, you know, uh, I guess, uh, access, you know, the, the one of the consequences, you know, putting millions of transcribers out of, out of business. Um, you can even, uh, you know, go further uh, in, uh, in this, you know. Uh, so things become automated that way. And then finally, uh, you have things that are multiplied. That is, you know, once the data has been harvested, right, uh, what guarantee do you have that it's going to be used for the purpose that uh, it was originally uh, harvested for, collected for. Um, here's an example for, from an interview um, that uh, we, uh, we got. He's an interviewee who started, had built an individual level database from getting permission uh, to access uh, company uh, email metadata. And he says, one of in investors says, actually, the most valuable data is people's purchase history. And that was not, the per you know, that was not for purchase history that the, that, uh, the database wanted to, um, uh, that was constituted. Uh, if I am blatantly honest, our terms of service is broad enough that we can do that if we want to. You know, that is, we can mine inboxes for purchase history. But eventually, someone is going to find out, and then it would be uncomfortable. So you can see that on the one hand, you know, there's a, you know, clearly he knows that, you know, for his company not to, you know, to uh, run into problems, this is something that uh, he shouldn't do. Uh, but, you know, there are other pressures, you know, pressure in this case from, uh, from the investor to do something else, to repurpose the data. So the data uh, can be multiplied and transformed. Another uh, aspect, uh, how do you multiply, again, how do you, you know, increase uh, the amount of data is quite simply through addictive design. There's a lot of um, uh, discussion right now uh, around this. There's uh, been lots of books and, you know, Tristan Harris uh, started uh, uh, an initiative uh, towards schools, you know, to, to, um, uh, because of, um, uh, to, to sort of try to uh, make companies more aware of the, problem, the addiction problem. But this is from a recent uh, interview uh, where, uh, you know, we heard about last week, uh, a few weeks ago, I've seen a guy in a keynote at a tech conference recently, and I was pretty shocked because he was pitching a book about how to make your apps more addictive to an audience of developers who are building these applications that my kids are going to use. And I hate my kids to be addicted to cell phone applications, right? Um, and then finally, of course, there's the continuous tracking, right? Uh, the, um, 
and the, uh, the fact that, you know, increasingly uh, the data is not simply uh, 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 there for, uh, you know, on, on the occasions where you are logged in, but in fact, you know, continuously uh, being produced by all kinds of devices that follow you. So, you know, why does this matter, okay? And as I said earlier, there are legitimate worries about freedom, privacy, democracy, uh, as in the you know, Cambridge Analytica case. But my own view is that it matters because the Faustian bargain is enabling the rise of a new kind of society, a new kind of social order. Um, we've had this uh, term, the new oil, uh, Nili Kroos, Vice President of the European Commission, famously referred to data as the new oil in 2012. People are now saying the new electricity. Uh, you know, what he meant and what uh, people mean by the, this is not simply that data is a profitable sector, but that data generation, refinement and use is actually the new fuel powering the entire economy. And, you know, we can legitimately ask ourselves, well, is this all really new, you know? Are we really in a sort of new stage of sort of economic development in which data uh, really um, become, you know, launches us, if you will, in a completely different kind of um, regime? And to some extent, uh, it isn't. You know, it might be worth pausing at this point and ask ourselves, you know, how did we get there? You know, how did we begin to see personal data as the new oil? You know, where did we begin doing this? After all, if we look back, surveillance in the economy, uh, that is, as Oscar Gandhi puts it, the capture of information for the purpose of producing intelligence or strategically useful knowledge is nothing new. Businesses have always had what Gandhi calls a legitimate business interest in collecting data about their consumers, their employees, or their competitors. So, you know, when did this legitimate interest in data, you know, what, sorry, what did this legitimate interest in data look like before Google? And of course, there are many examples. Uh, if we look back in history, uh, we can think of the rise of credit, the rise of insurance, the rise of marketing, uh, industries as, you know, having been enabled by the emergence of personal profiling in the name of precisely that kind of legitimate um, interest. So what I will do is I will actually develop the example of credit because I think if we think about the history of credit, we see encapsulated in it uh, uh, some very fundamental processes that can help us understand you know, what our future may be, you know, what is it that, you know, credits, if you will, might stand in for something much bigger. So, um, if we look back uh, in history, um, in the United States, uh, we begin in the, you know, the, the rise of collecting information about uh, persons began in the 1840s. Uh, the Mercantile Agency, which became Dun & Bradstreet in 1933, sought to create a national centralized system of credit checking for merchants. And interestingly, they relied upon the gift-to-get model. Uh, interestingly, the information was obtained by third parties, so most of the data collection on, in, on these merchants, on these individuals, was done for free by local attorneys in exchange for referrals to prostitutes to prosecute debt collection cases. So, you know, so already then you had a model in which, you know, I give you some information and you give me additional information that will be useful for me. And so you had these sort of two parties on the one hand, the credit registry, and on the other hand, the local attorneys that were sort of working together. Um, in the 1870s, we saw the beginning of consumer credit reporting, which originated among retailers that was fairly decentralized. But by the 1920s, you know, you started having a more national credit reporting infrastructure that was in place. And that whole history has been described by Josh Lauer in his book, uh, Creditworthy. 
Um, so, you know, the concept of financial identity was born someone who wanted credit, but of course you can think of insurance as working pretty much the same way, had to subject themselves uh, to intrusive prob probing of their character and behavior. In fact, Josh Lauer argues that, a quote, applying for credit was the original sin of modern consumer surveillance. Um, so the difference with today, of course, was that then it was done by individuals, often relying on rumor and gossip, uh, rather than, you know, on the me mechanical operation of computers. Now, the 1970s and the 1980s in the United States, so the rapid concentration of the credit reporting business, and now, it, you know, um, by the 1980s, you, you had sort of three companies that had emerged as the most important ones. And of course, you know, with growing computerization, it became also a lot more uh, efficient. The companies also diversified towards other types of data collection. So today, uh, in effect, a lot of uh, 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 companies like Experience, for instance, is holding much more data than credit. It is actually a data broker. So they started purchasing um, um, uh, retail uh, brokers and marketing data. So from then on, the way that individual data was used changed. Um, so you started having, you know, very... So these profiles started moving from being... Individual profiles from being sort of qualitative, right? With lots of verbal information to increasingly numerical. So what is a profile? A profile is essentially a primary primarily a list of categories that have, you know, this is from Gandhi, that have been determined to be relevant to some administrative decision that must be made by an organization with regard to an individual, a group, or a class. Individual categories or variables are the dimensions along which an entity may be evaluated. And then, of course, subset of categories may be combined into an index score, uh, sort of a, 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 a grade, if you want. The fundamental purpose of a profile is the assignment, this is an important aspect, is the assignment of an individual into a class or a category that represents a decision. Okay, so this is a process of identification with a consequence. So we have moved, if you think about credit, we have moved from a situation um, in the 1960s where essentially you were inside the credit market or you were outside. If you were inside the credit market, the conditions didn't vary too much across uh, consumers, right? And if you are outside, you didn't have access to credit, or you could maybe uh, obtain credit, but with sort of loan sharks and, um, and sort of more shady kinds of um, uh, suppliers. By the 1990s, and of even more the 2000s, increasingly, you know, the market expands massively, and what we have is that we have an increasing differentiation of people on the basis of this numerical information. So the purpose of a profile now changes, and it it's not so much about deciding whether the person should be given credit or not. It becomes should you know at, under which at which terms uh, should that person obtain credit. So it is uh, uh, the purpose is now to assign on the basis of that information the individual to a prediction. What are the chances that? such a person will repay her loan. And you can think about this in every domain, right? What are the person, the chances that such a person has diabetes, you know, that they will have an accident and so on and so forth. So this is, um, you know, this is the rise of predictive analytics, okay? Uh, so the, you know, the, we have uh, the development, as I said, the development of the credit reporting infrastructure, but of course that's true of other kinds of infrastructure, allowed for centralization of surveillance. You know, now, you know, with, armed with this instrument, you could expand your business to all kinds of populations on the strength of the records held by the credit reporting agencies. Uh, and the real uh, important change uh, in the, the mid-1980s is the rise of Prescore, a statistical scoring tool using credit bureau data, uh, which was developed by the Fair Isaac um, and Company in the mid-1980s, which now allowed banks to increasingly seek consumers that were pre-screened. Okay? 
Um, so scoring, you know, facilitates this assignment of an individual to a class or a category for the purpose of decision making. And the development of credit scoring was a decisive step, allowing lending decisions to be now largely automated. And, sh and of course, that is one of the things that fueled the massive expansion of credit and debt in the American economy. The FICO score, uh, which, uh, which is a cre the, the credit score, uh, was developed in, uh, uh, as we know it today, um, you know, is a, a score roughly between uh, 300 and 900, it depends on different kinds of, of, of scores, but that was unveiled in 1989, and it was, you know, it is today entirely based on financial behavior data, or so FICO claims, because this is essentially, this comes from the FICO, uh, that, that company, uh, you know, this is essentially the, um, the information that they give, but of course the, the, the actual algorithm uh, remains uh, secret. But by and large, this is what it looks like. Uh, a lot of, you know, the largest portion of your score depends on your payment history. Um, the length of your credit history is quite important too. How long have you been using credit? You know, if you've been using credit cards for like 20 years, um, you know, you have built a history as opposed to, you know, the last two years. Uh, how much you owe and how much of your available credit have you used? So it turns out that, you know, you may be allowed to say, uh, um, borrow uh, $10,000 on your credit card. You have a credit limit of $10,000, but it turns out that you shouldn't be using 10000 You should be using, say, 1000 uh, And this is, you know, so... Um, you know, the percentage of the credit that you have used relative to the credit limit. And then, of course, the different types of credit uh, are also important. So this is what it looks like. And then, of course, you're probably uh, quite um, familiar with this because in Germany you have Schufa, right? So I don't know much about Schufa, uh, but this is essentially what it looks like. So, uh, you know, uh, so the, the you know, I, I showed you, you know, the, the different components of the score, uh, but then once you have uh, a, a credit score, then you have uh, an assignment of an individual to a decision, right? And the decision, again, is increasingly different uh, terms of service. Um, so increasing, you know, by, by, the, by the 2000s, the evaluation of credit risk was fully individualized and really based on individual behavior. Um, now, this is important. You may think, okay, all of this on credit, you know, it's not exciting, that has nothing to do with the digital society. It has everything to do with the digital society. Because that is the basis of essentially uh, the kind of social order that is uh, being uh, produced in the digital society. That is sort of, if you will, the original model, the original sin, as uh, Josh Lohr puts it. The other reason why it's important is that um, in the United States today, uh, credit reports and credit scores have become wired into many different industries. So not simply credit, but also, you know, if you want to rent an apartment, if you want to apply for a job, you have to show a credit report. If you want to rent an apartment, you have to show your credit score. Uh, it becomes wired into insurance products. Um, so, you know, it has these effects that, um, uh, uh, sociologists in the United States calls uh, turbo performativity. That is, the score, you know, comes to have effects uh, outside of the financial system proper into people's life chances um, on the labor market, on the insurance market, on the housing market, and so on and so forth. Now, so, you know, we've talked about predictive analytics and, the, you know, you know, Assignment of an individual to a risk category, okay? But predictive analytics not only enables better risk predictions, it can also be mobilized to harness value. So in other words, you can actually score conditionally on the risk level. So the question is now different. Given someone's score, or they're fitting into a predicted category, how much value can I possibly extract? Okay, so there's two questions that are quite different, right? One is you calculate 
the risk that an individual represents or the likelihood that a certain outcome will uh, be realized. Two, you know, on the basis of your knowledge of this outcome, how much money can you make? Okay? And of course, how much value can you possibly extract? You know, um, you know, depends on a lot of other considerations and behavioral data. So, for instance, you may be scoring on the likelihood that someone may be tempted by a crappy loan offer or, you know, a crappy insurance plan. You know, now it becomes, you know, uh, about uh, trying to evaluate a lot of other things about who they are. Okay? This is where, you know, the financial behavior meets all kinds of other types of behavior. So the point now, okay, is very important. The point is to estimate the value or the profits to be made from particular individuals in known, that is in predicted situations. So from an economics point of view, for those of you who know a little bit of economics, this is trying to manage at the willingness to pay. Okay? So this means that prices and services will fluctuate quite significantly across space and over time, and that they will also be increasingly differentiated not simply across groups, but across individuals. Okay? So now you can design systems that will offer different terms of service to different individuals, not simply on the basis of the risk that they represent, but also on the basis of these other considerations. Okay? So, of course, in that situation, the better and more abundant the data, the better firms can predict is it the desired outcome. So, you know, for instance, uh, it turns out that your Facebook likes can predict, as you know, a whole lot of things about, of, about you. Uh, and that, you know, this was used quite profitably in the last presidential election. But, you know, it can predict a lot of, uh, a lot of things that may be relevant to the kind of things that I mentioned earlier, like what is the kind of product that you may be tempted with. Um, so what we have is that, you know, we constantly have, you, we have a situation in, in which, you know, people are being constantly tested upon so as to refine, further refine predictability. Uh, the other thing, of course, that is happening is this fusion of information across the system. All data is good data, uh, even that which appears uh, irrelevant and the kind of data that I just mentioned, you know, your Facebook likes, which looks like it is irrelevant. Right? You know, what kind of movie you like looks like it is irrelevant. Well, it turns out it says a lot about the kind of person you are, the kind of social media you come from, the kind of family situations that you have, uh, and so on. Now, of course, um, what makes these pieces worth collecting is and integrated is a powerful cultural abstraction. You know, the notion that somewhere deep inside lies a knowable uh, actor uh, an individual who uh, might be understood, followed, and manipulated efficiently from cradle to grave. So, now, how do we think about these processes sociologically, which is really what, is, what interests me here? You know? What do we have here? You know, what kind of society are we uh, preparing ourselves for? So, Michel Foucault said, sorry, he said in Discipline and, and Punish that visibility is a trap. In History of Sexuality, he argued that people are controlled by the fact that they are constantly compelled to speak, to put it all out there. Of course, that was in the context of the Catholic or the psychoanalytic confession, but you can see the implication here, right? Saying a lot about yourself um, is actually, uh, you know, puts you at the mercy of the expert, the therapist, the priest, whatever. Similarly, digital systems incite us to be visible, to engage, you know, the credit card, the loyalty card, the hyperlink, the social rules that incite us to like posts and comments, you know, something that, you know, 
I learned from my teenager, and most of you probably learned by yourselves. You know? So resisting is actually hard. And the question is that he may not even be desirable, right? Maybe, maybe invisibility is a trap too. Those who are invisible to the system actually uh, are of little use to it or worse. So there's some really interesting work on sort of Facebook feeds uh, by Tanya Buescher, you know, who shows that those who don't engage on Facebook, well, rapidly, uh, they sink uh, into, you know, the bottom, if you will, of the list. They become invisible to others, right? So, you know, if you don't chat with your friends, if you don't like posts and comments, you know, the algorithm is not going to put you in a position to be seen. So you become invisible, right? Sociologist Janet Fertizzi at Princeton engaged in a clever effort to keep her pregnancy invisible from online vendors. She decided to spend only cash, not, you know, she told her friends not to mention her pregnancy to anybody. You know, she wanted to see what would happen. Um, and so what she wanted to do is she said, well, uh, she actually wanted to buy a, a stroller. And she said, well, um, how can I buy a stroller? And she wanted a stroller that was not available, I forget, uh, in her, uh, you know, in a, in a store uh, right next to, uh, uh, right next to her. So she tried to buy on Amazon, right? But she decided to use sort of gift cards, you know, in order not to tie this to her credit card. Okay? And, but it turns out so that she went to the local, you know, a convenience store and tried to buy $500 worth of Amazon gift cards. But it turns out that when somebody uh, tries to do that, uh, they will look suspect. And her husband and herself, you know, they were uh, reported uh, to the police. <laughs> because it turns out that if you actually try, you know, uh, to, in two days, uh, non-cash economy, right? to the credit card-based economy, well, you look like a member of what I call, uh, with Kieran Healy in, in my work, the lumpen scoretariat, right? <laughs> you know, the bottom of the scoring scale. You know, the, uh, the people who only work with cash and people who only work with cash typically in our society are coded as criminals. So invisibility is a trap too. Those who deviate from behavioral expectations raise flags, signaling possibly illegal behavior. Okay? And then finally, the, uh, the technological infrastructure of the digital economy embeds all kinds of truth-telling dispositives, you know, leading us to reveal who we really are. Now, the benign side of this identity, you know, revealing process is, of course, just verification, you know, authenticating who you are. And in many ways, this is the basis for a lot of very convenient uh, transactions, you know. Uber, you know, you press on your Uber app to call your taxi, you know, immediately they know who you are, you know, who they are, you know, it's, it's, it makes everything very, very um, smooth. But the more troubling side of this is the reconstruction by the digital society of what Irving Goffman called the backstage. You know, data-rich algorithms are taken to produce a truth about us. You know, that part of truth, actually, that we don't often, we, do not, we don't control. You know, for Goffman, you had a backstage where you relaxed, you were really who you, yeah? and then you had a front stage that you were presenting to the world. But now, now algorithms have access to the backstage, right? Because you know, so Facebook can predict when you're going to break up with, uh, you know, your partner, for instance, before you even do it. So, after Foucault, of course, I'm French, you know, you're going to get some Bourdieu. And uh, the reason is that I find that Bourdieu is really useful here, too. Um, we can think of the totality of one's interactions with the digital economy, if you will, as a sort of form of capital, in the sense of Bourdieu, that is, as, uh, as he calls it, accumulated labor, which has a potentiality to, profit, pro to produce profits. We call this 
uber capital, okay? And the reason is that it is a form of capital that results from everything, right? So we have to find a term that sort of capture that, that sort of status, right? Uh, it overlaps with the traditional forms identified by Bourdieu, like it overlaps, for instance, with your cultural capital, but at the same time, it departs from them. You know, it has a clear uh, materiality and it could take, in principle, a numerical form. It is accumulated over the long history of a person's recorded action, built up from traces left on everything, from social media to credit bureaus, to shopping websites and fidelity programs, courthouses, pharmacies, and the contents, of course, of your emails and chats. It incorporates your social ties, which are now measurable, right, through the value of your social network, and, you know, some measure of your moral worth, okay? So you can think about this as a potentiality, right? Um, so we call it uber capital. We have a larger term for it, for the computer scientists among you. Uh, which is eigencapital. And, you know, it's a little bit, eigencapital, it's a little bit as if each system in your life was doing something like the credit scoring system, right? So on the financial side, you know, you have a credit score. But your social network data can be also subject to the same kind of scoring processes, right? And maybe your health data can do the same thing, you know, measuring your sort of your, your fitness and so on and so forth. So you can imagine this as a sort of, as a vector, right, in a vector of space among the thousands of dimensions of data that all of these companies are keeping about you, okay? And so if you think of a God's, you know, of, of, of a God view on you, that would be uber capital. If you think more about the individual projections, that's a, you know, that's an eigencapital. Um, so, like cultural capital, uber capital may exist in three, under three principal forms. The first form is that it is embodied, you know, it is expressing some durable dispositions about yourself, your fitness, your sociability, your social influence, your character, you know, that's the Foucauldian truth. At the same time, it is also, uh, it is objectivated or objectified, it is realized in the forms of access to goods and services. So when you have the capital, right, a certain kind of measured worth, if you will, you get access to certain goods and services, better social consideration, better prices. You know, you board early on the plane. You don't have to wait when you call customer service, right? And it is finally institutionalized in the sense that it, it may exist as a quantity that is widely used and, you know, the kind of off-label use that I mentioned earlier, where, you know, it, it goes from credit to um, housing to insurance and so on and so forth. It can circulate, okay? Um, it can circulate also in, uh, you know, very far away corners. So, you know, dating websites today increasingly are using your credit score, okay? So, the way that I'm thinking about Uber capital is, if you will, as a potentiality, right? The technology is driving us in a particular direction, right? To the creation of sort of these increasingly uh, measured qualities at the, um, you know, on, on, uh, of the individual on different markets. But it doesn't exist as a fully coherent, institutionalized thing. It doesn't exist as a number. I couldn't tell you, yo, you, Uber Capital is like 596. But in China, you can, right? So, um, in the US, it's only integrated very well on the financial side, but in China, it is a reality, okay? So, as you probably know, I'm sure, you know, people uh, who are coming to this series are familiar with this. Um, in 2014, the Chinese government gave a license to eight data companies to develop social credit systems. Um, and so the way that this works, and it was the, you know, this is the one developed by the Alipay, the subsidiary of Alibaba, and the way that um, they produce a score is by scoring you on your credit history, on your ability to fulfill the con your contractual uh, obligations. There's, of course, a verification element, which is always important. But it scores you also on your interpersonal relationships. So, if I'm connected to you, and your score is lower than mine, then 
that will lower my score, right? So I have an interest in actually breaking off the relationship. And then it scores you on all kinds of preferences and behaviors, right, that are deemed useful or not useful, right? And indeed, the scoring system is also connected to third-party apps. So when you have a high score, for instance, you get access in other apps. You want to rent a car, for instance. You get access to, um, to uh, certain kinds of services, right? or certain kinds of preferences, and then depending on your behavior in that app, you know, say you run a red light or something with a rented car or something, you could imagine the system feeding back into the original credit score. So there is, again, you know, the ability, you know, from the original score to sort of multiply through the third parties app in the same way, if you will, that originally, um, social, um, uh, the digital companies multiply themselves with the developers. Well, that's exactly the same process that is happening, but for scoring, okay? Um, now, originally, the system was developed by a private company, Alibaba, but uh, recently, the uh, State Council uh, has called for the establishment of a nationwide tracking system to uh, rate the reputation of individuals, businesses, and government officials, okay? So now uh, there's uh, uh, increasing integration, at least planned integration, between public and private sources to develop a credit system that covers the whole society. Now whether, and that, what is important is that then it, again, it will uh, help regulate pretty much everything. You know, your uh, so that's the plan at least. Your bro broadband speed, your foreign travel visa, your social benefits, your access to elite restaurants, your insurance premiums, the possibly even the quality of sco schooling offered to, offer to your children, according to some uh, reporting, uh, might actually depend on that. So you can see that, you know, you have uh, a ranking system of individuals that... Uh, um, will be connected to a system of reward and punishment. And there's a plan also for corporations. This is from the China Monitor last year, which sort of details exactly what the kind of data might come in for corporations and what are the effects on a certain number of outcomes. So, you, you know, the condition of credit that corporations might have access to, the access to public contracts, travel privileges of the corporation, uh, uh, executives and officials and so on might depend on it. And then, of course, you can imagine also an integration, and this is part of the plan, an integration between the individual scores and the company scores so that if you are, you know, if a company is made up, if you will, or composed of individuals with lower score, that will also lower the score of the company. So, you know, you will have an, in, uh, an integration. So, why does this matter? Well, of course, people, you know, worry about the political consequences of this big brother type of system. But perhaps more profound and more interesting are the consequences in terms of social stratification and inequality, okay? So, you know, the road to increasing efficiency and profits will be now to match, right, individuals to what algorithm determine they deserve, right? That will be... Uh, you know, the process of value extraction, if you will, will um, capitalize on people's behavior, their dispositions, their habits, you know, refracted, of course, through the very particular classificatory architecture of the digital economy. Now, this is not new. Inequality has always been moralized, right? Uh, all forms of dominations have been buttressed by distinctions between the deserving and the undeserving. And of course, this is debates that we have constantly about the welfare state. You know, do people deserve the social benefits that they have access to, right? Um, this is how systems of power always legitimate this themselves. But in this particular case, you can see that this is a system that is going to be harder to contest uh, politically. The reason is that first, mobilization in this kind of system doesn't come about naturally, right? Because rather than, you know, we will have a graded, you have a sort of graded scale rather than groups, you know, say, workers, 
versus uh, managers or, as Marx said, you know, since it was his birthday, you know, the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie, right? The social co collectives that actuarial practices produce um, are just sort of aggregations of people. Right now, you know, there's no natural solidarity among them, right? They're not solidaristic communities bound by categorical status or by, or by voluntaristic choice. That's the first point. You know, it is hard to develop a politics in this kind of system. But second, in this system, outcomes appear to be legitimate. Uh, in China, uh, Sesame Credit uh, is quite well accepted because it is seen as increasing trust. As Xiao Jinkin, and I'm quoting from an article from the Süddeutsche Zeitung, actually, um, as Xiao Jikin uh, from the Shanghai Municipal Commission of Economy and Informatization, which is in charge of the Honest Shanghai app, put it in a response to an interviewer, it is all about bringing order to the market. And ultimately, it's also about social order. So that's a, you know, and this, this more, this remoralization of the whole system comes from the fact that differences in outcome in outcomes are seen to emanate only from behavioral differences, right? Uh, rather than some other sort of difference, like categorical differences, you know, men and women, you know, discrimination, whatever, which are protected by law. In this case, it's just you. It's your fault, right? Um, and therefore, those who, whether individuals or corporate entities who are outside, are really truly outside. They are truly outside because the principle of their exclusion seems to lie truly within them. Within them. And, you know, as uh, the, uh, an article in Wired puts it, in the end, it's just you. Um, so, you can see now the social force of this kind of system, right? Um, and, of course, it's not lost to the designers uh, uh, in China. Um, in the, the city of Rongcheng... Oh, oh, sorry, the other quote was from the Wired article. This is from the Süddeutsche Zeitung. In the city of Rongcheng, a civil servant tells a journalist from Süddeutsche Zeitung who has come to inquire about his city's pioneering role in this domain. We want to civilize people. He proudly cites the founding document of the Office of Honesty of the city of Rongcheng allow the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. Now, of course, whether the system will work the way it's supposed to, you know, whether it will be something totally fictional, you know, garbage numbers that people ignore, or whether it will be something in between, like it kind of works, but not exactly how it's supposed to, we don't know yet. But if the Chinese situation is a guide to the potential appeal of universal scoring, and remembering that similar, if more decentralized tendencies are at work on this side of the world, there is little reason to think that this kind of design will not be part of our future, the way the FICO score is already embedded in our present. I will stop here and let you meditate on this. Thank you very much.